Welcome to the Seth Gruber Show. We are still here at NRB, National Religious Broadcasters. Um, we, we, we rolled out a ton of these cool interviews for you. Uh, we're, we're posting them more often than I usually post podcasts because how can you not when you have so many fighters and warriors all gathered together in the same place here in Nashville, February 2024? We have probably one of my heroes, one of my favorite authors. I actually call her the, the, the Schaefer of the 21st century. Um, and, and, and she's actually going to tell you some really interesting stories about that. Um, but her new book, Toxic War on Masculinity, How Christianity Reconciles the Sexes, Nancy Piercy, is, is probably one of the biggest gifts of the body of Christ in the 21st century in our out-of-control, kooky, Sodomite and Gomorrah-ish sort of culture of death. And so, um, Nancy, thank you for coming onto the show and for joining us. And thank you for your—I mean, I, I don't think anyone weaves together— philosophy, sociology, theology, and storytelling um, better than you. And Love Thy Body changed my life when I read that book. And if you guys are listening to this, you, you should go right now, go to Amazon and buy Nancy's book, Love Thy Body, and her new book, The Toxic War on Masculinity. But before we launch into just your incredible work, Nancy, um, I, I want my listeners to know who Nancy Fiercy is, your background, um, because you're now one of the foremost worldview thinkers, in my opinion, in the church, in America, and in the West. But how did you become that? You weren't always that. Can you share with us a little bit of your personal story? Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you, because I love to tell my personal story, to good, be honest. Good. Um, I, the, the older I get, the more thankful I am that God got hold of me. Wow, so, yeah. so I was raised in a Christian home, but it was, a, it was an ethnic home. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but all Scandinavians are Lutheran. Okay. Just like all Irish are Catholic. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So it was a, a more of an ethnic background. Okay. Um, but, but so when I reached high school and started asking questions, my parents just had no answers. Um, I was going to a secular high school, secular teachers, secular textbooks. Yeah. And actually, all I was asking is, how do we know Christianity is true? Yeah, yeah. But, you know. Um, well, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, I asked a, a Christian um, prof- university professor, I, point blank, why are you Christian? He said. Works for me. Wow. Really? <laughs> and then I had a chance to talk to a uh, seminary dean, and I thought I would get something more substantial. And all he said was, don't worry, we all have doubts sometimes. So not very Berean, you're saying. <laughs> as, as if it was a psychological, <laughs> psychological phase I, you know, that I would outgrow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and actually, because I got no answers, I finally made the very important decision that of just leaving it all behind. I thought, well, if I don't... I thought of it as a matter of intellectual honesty. Yeah. That if you don't have good reasons for something, you shouldn't say you believe it. Yeah. Whether it's Christianity or anything. Yeah, that's right. And since nobody was giving me any good reasons, <laughs> um, and I didn't have any myself, so I, yeah. I started, that's what I started walking down the hallway at the public high school I attended and pulling books off the philosophy shelf. Wow, really? And it wasn't, an, or... an, it wasn't an academic interest. It was like, who do I find who can answer my uh, questions? Wow. You know, because isn't that the philosopher's job? Yes, that's right. right? What is truth? Yeah. How do we know it? Is there a foundation for ethics? Or is yeah. it just and truth? To explain it to the layperson in a way they can understand. And, and so that's how I got it. For, and by the way, I figured out pretty quickly if there is no God, the answer to all those questions is no. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> there yeah. is no meaning, no foundation for ethics. I even thought there's no foundation for knowledge in the sense that if all ha- I have is my puny brain yeah. and the vast scope of time and history, what makes me think I could have some sort of transcendent universal truth? It's very C.S. Lewis. Ridiculous. <laughs> so by the time I graduated from high school, I was a completely secular thinker. And, wow. Um, so I was very prime for an apologetics approach. I, I went to Europe, and we lived in Europe when I was a child. Oh, really? Yeah. Right. And so I, you tell some of your family story in the, in the intro or the first chapter of, of this book, which I thought it was really cool to learn more about your background. Yeah, but we lived there, and I'd loved it so much that all okay. through high school, I saved my money. <laughs> okay, and you went back. So that I could go back. How old were you when you went back? Right after high school. Wow, 18, 17? Yeah. Wow, okay. <laughs> right, right, 18. Um, I, I, my my uh, high school job was playing the the violin in the El Paso Symphony. El wow, Paso. <laughs> that's amazing. So when I say I saved my money. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah. I, wow. Uh, okay. And I went to study at the Heidelberg Conservatory okay. in, in, in Germany. Um, and so through sort of a series of um, coincidences, I did end up at Labrie, which is in Switzerland. Yeah. And Labrie is, a, it's in the French part of Switzerland. So Labrie is French for the, the shelter. That's right. And it's the ministry of Francis Schaeffer. Yeah. And his approach was very much apologetics. And I had never encountered Christian apologetics before. I had no idea you could defend Christianity with good reasons and arguments. Oh. 
that I could stand up against all the secularisms yeah, that yeah. I'd absorbed by that time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was so impressed, in fact, that I left after a month. <laughs> I was afraid I might be drawn in emotionally. You, oh, you know, interesting. Because it was so attractive. Okay, okay. So appealing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I never met such an appealing form of Christianity before. Wow. Um, and, and, but the thing is, Christianity had let me down once before, and so I was not mm. going to do this unless I was intellectually convinced it was true. Hmm. You know, yeah, I didn't yeah, want to yeah. be emotionally drawn in. Yeah. Uh, so I went back to the States, and uh, to, through that, through um, Libri, I discovered there was apologetics, so reading... There were answers. <laughs> yeah. Well, reading Schaefer, Lewis, that's how I found Lewis. Yeah. Chesterton, Os Guinness. Yep. He was at Libri when I was there. He was, that's right. Like he was I didn't know that, I just forgot that, that's right. <laughs> So, so cool. So uh, just on my own reading, I decided I, I I had read enough to be convinced that it was true. Wow. And then I thought, where do I find other Christians? Because hmm. I was not in a church or anything. Yeah. I said, well, I knew some back at Labrie. Wow. <laughs> so a, a year and a half later, I went back to Labrie. No way. And that's where I, I stayed four months and got, you know, established, really, yeah. really grounded in Christian worldview that wow. way. And so that's why everything I write, uh, everything I teach yeah. has to do with Christian worldview yeah. and apologetics. Yeah. Because I, I just have such a heart for young people who had the kind of questions I had. Yeah, you know? yeah, I can see that. And, 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 I, and I could see that when I, read, when I read your book, Love Thy Body, it was very clear that this, that this was more than just uh, an academic ascent for you, but that this was very personal and you wanted to provide good answers, you know. Um, so, guys, did you hear that? Uh, that's Francis Schaeffer, y'all. That's... Uh, <laughs> considered the probably maybe the most persuasive along with Chesterton Christian apologist of the 20th century uh Nancy Piercy here who I believe is kind of the Schaefer of the 21st century sat under Schaefer at Libri in Switzerland um I gotta tell you I think I was born in the wrong generation <laughs> Nancy I'm a little bit jealous right now I'm trying not to sit in my jealousy um so um you wrote this book that I interviewed you on a couple of years ago called Love Thy Body I do want to talk about your new book as well, of course, but um, one of something that I, it had never struck me before, although I understand that all human conflict is ultimately theological, that man is fundamentally a religious being. We can't get away from that fact. So actually, when you rip God out of a culture, we go right back to demon worship. We actually just become uber religious. It's just a religion in the wrong direction. It becomes really pagan and kooky and weird. And it just resembles the Asherah poles and the Baal statues again. It's actually no, yeah. no different. But but yeah. the, but your approach in Love Thy Body blew my mind. In fact, I gave a I gave a message at my earthly hero, Pastor Jack Hibbs Church, mm -hmm. um, last summer, and I called my. It, it wasn't a Sunday morning, and it wasn't live stream because YouTube would have pulled it immediately, Nancy. But it was a ninety minute talk I gave to about a thousand Christians at an event he had at his church, and I called my lecture. All human conflict is ultimately theological, and I benefited greatly from your book, Love Thy Body, and crafting my talk. Because fundamentally what you say is that, correct me if I'm wrong, and now I want you to speak to this for our listeners, but is it right to say that seemingly one old Christian heresy is the animating feature behind every new iteration of the culture of death and the liberal establishment's celebration and integration of every new uh, secular sacrament? Yes, I tell people that what we're up against is very much what the uh, early church was up against. Because, uh, I mean, let me put it this way. Yep. People accuse Christians of being bigots, right? This is, <laughs> this is why the apologetics approach has changed, because people aren't asking anymore, is Christianity true? Uh, They're yeah. asking, why are Christians such bigots? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And so what I do is... We're I, not, we're not. <laughs> yeah. Well, I turn the table. Uh, yeah, yeah. But... And I show that, actually, it's the secular ethic that is negative and dehumanizing because it has a low view of the body. Yes, yes. Right? I mean, the most obvious is transgenderism, yeah. which says your body has nothing to do with your psychological sex. Your real identity. Your real identity. Your, your, your biological identity has nothing to do with your psychological identity. And uh, there's a, a BBC documentary that said at the heart of the debate is the idea that your mind can be at war with your body. Your mind, your mind can, can be, be at war with your body. And, and who wins? So the, it's, the mind. It's bifurcated. Yeah, exactly. Right. So we're not. So the claim then being the belief, the religious belief then that you're saying that undergirds what I call the religion of transgenderism, which is really the religion of Gnosticism, is this belief that we are not both body and soul. Right. So I help people to realize this is what the early Christian church was up against. Gnosticism, Neoplatonism, yeah. Manichaeism, you know, Augustine yeah. was a Manichae. Yeah. All of these isms right. in the early church period denigrated the material world yeah. for very different reasons. Right. 
But they saw this world as the realm of death, decay, and destruction. Right. And the goal of salvation was to escape from this world. Yeah, yeah. And, Metaphysical. To climb to higher levels. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, my spiritual but, being, my spiritual nature. So like, I'm not quite sure if there's a in, historical connection, but there certainly is a similarity between the the early church, which had to defend the goodness of creation. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The, the, our body, our, our, the handiwork of God, yeah. and are good and should be honored. And Paul, the Apostle Paul, was preaching against Gnosticism. But, uh, it, yes, in uh, Colossians especially, yeah, uh, Ephesians to some extent, but yeah, in fact, when I, uh, I we just went through this in one of my classes. Yeah, I have aisle. a breakdown of Colossians and show here's where he's talking about Gnosticism. Yeah. Here's where he's talking about Gnosticism. Wow. <laughs> yeah, isn't that fascinating? Because now, correct me if I'm wrong, Nancy, but the 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 the, the early Christian heretics that that Paul and others had to correct or preach against, they believed that the physical world was the result of like there's an evil demigod or something like this, and so it, as such, it could not be trusted. The physical world doesn't provide any, as you say, any clues to your real identity, so it can be dismissed. So to to attain true identity, real knowledge, secret knowledge, gnosis, um, you need to you need to almost liberate yourself from your body and focus on the metaphysical identity, the spirit. What they're trying to talk about is the soul. They're trying to they're trying to talk about when when the transgender people say I am not my body yeah. or the real me. They're trying to talk about the soul. But they, they don't have the Christian language to talk about it. Is that right? I, they say the self. Yeah. The authentic self. Right. But you're right. Yeah. You're right. I mean, Gnosticism uh, taught that there were several levels of spiritual beings. And it was the lowest level who was actually an evil god who created this world. A physical. Yeah, because the physical world is evil. Right. Therefore, it must have been an evil god that created it. Wow. And so, and, and First John writes about it, too. Why did, why did um, John say the test, to test the spirits, you ask, did Jesus come in the flesh? Mm. Today, we're like... But Whoa, what's so unpack big about that? I see what you're saying, but unpack that. Because more. the Gnostics taught that Jesus was just one of those higher entities. That's right. Who had come down to the earth yeah. and yeah. did not have an actual physical body. Yeah. And did not actually die on the cross. Right. But as- reascended then to the higher echelons of spiritual, yeah. you know, the spiritual realms. And so that's um, the technical theological term is docetism. Docetism means to seem. He seemed to have a body. Oh, that's right. Yeah. But yeah, he did yeah. not really have a body because that's, you know, that's what the Gnostics taught. That's why yeah. John says, test the spirits by asking that's if kingdom. Jesus actually came in a in, body. In the flesh, in the body. In the thread. Right. Yeah, yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. That is so good. Um, I, um, what, one of my favorite uh, lines from you, and I write down a lot of your quotes because they're, frankly, they're, they're so profound. Um, you, you, you talked in your book, Love Thy Body, and, and I, I want you to kind of unpack this, but it, it, you had this section called the, the, A Freedom That Dissolves Freedom. And what I believe you were trying to teach Christians in the church was that um, when, when nature is no longer a teacher and we can't ascertain from nature or the physical world, right, any, any eternal truths— but your, your body doesn't provide any signals to your real identity because your male chromosomes or your male genitals don't tell you who you are because mm-hmm. I am not my body. <laughs> the real me is something metaphysical. So my body's just kind of like, I think you've, you've talked about a BBC trans person that called it a meat skeleton. Like my body's just a meat skeleton. You're right. There was another BBC. Yeah. Doctor, it was it another house is my real uh-huh. identity, but that's not the uh-huh. real me. And you mm-hmm. talked about in your book how basically the dangers of, of bifurcating the human person what ends up happening is 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 when nature can no longer define for us fundamental aspects of human identity, then the state must. Good point. Yes. <laughs> so we end up handing over power to the state to define for us and our social community, our country, what we used to allow nature itself to define for us. And of course, if there's a nature and there's a law, then there's a lawgiver, we, meaning God himself. And you went through both uh, the abortion issue um, the transgender issue or gender gender identity, parenthood, the same-sex marriage, that if we no longer let nature define what marriage is for us, what life is, the baby, the right to life, parenthood, the state will end up defining those for us. Um, anyways, can you talk more about that? Like, why, In other words, why is it so important for us to get theology right? Why is it so important for us to get our understanding of the soul correct? Mm-hmm. It's in order to have a free society... The state has to acknowledge that there are some pre-political rights. That means the state doesn't create them. The state merely recognizes them. And many of those pre-political rights are based on biology or nature. <laughs> right. So 
the right to life, which is the most fundamental of all. Yeah. Up until recently, up until Roe v. Wade, it was assumed that you had the right to life just because you remember the human race. You're you know? a sapient. Yeah. You're a human. And the, the state didn't give you that right. The state acknowledged that you had that right. But what did the state do in Roe? Is the Supreme Court said, uh, no, being biologically human is not relevant. What's relevant is personhood. And personhood was this non-biological, like you said, merely psycho psychological sense of, uh, in fact, when the, when the um, defense attorney started saying, wait a minute, we're defending rights to abortion based on, on biology. And Justice Kennedy literally said, really? He, it, it didn't even com compute. He said, I thought it was about dignity. Oh, wow. So he didn't even understand the argument that, no, we're talking about uh, that yeah. biologically, you're a human being, you have the right to life. Yeah. Or um, marriage. Up until recently, it was assumed that marriage is a natural institution. Men and women naturally come together and form families. But in order to give same-sex couples the same status as opposite-sex couples, the state essentially had to say, Biology has nothing biology to do with it. Biology has nothing to do with it, right. It's just merely... It's not based on biological difference. It's emotional connection. Right. The trouble is we have lots of emotional connections, so who decides which emotional connection qualifies as marriage? Yeah, that's right. It will be the state. That's yeah. right. Ultimately. Yeah. Or to define what a marriage is. To define what marriage is, yeah. right. And and you say in which emotional commitments qualify as marriage. Right, right. So they'll decide what qualifies. Or a transgenderism. Uh, it, used to, it used to be thought that you're gender yeah. followed naturally from your sex. Biological sex. Biological sex. Yeah. But in order to treat, say, a trans woman who is biologically male, Dude. the same as a biological woman, the state has to essentially say biology doesn't matter. That's right. You know, all that matters is, like you said, that internal sense of your soul, you know, yeah, your, yeah. your gender you identity. Feel and desire. And so, and again, so the state has decided, you know, who qualifies as a male or female? Yeah, yep, that's right. And parenthood. So this was um, this is scary. This, this was scary. Pavan. It was um, it's it's one that I've ha heard almost no Christians mention, but um, up until recently, yeah. it was assumed that parenthood was biologically based. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Obviously, the woman who bears the child is the mother, and the father, her husband, was considered to be the legal parent, the, right, the right. legal father. It was called the presumption of parentage. Yeah. In other words, we're not going to go out to prove it. We'll just assume her husband's the biological parent. Yeah. And then the state said, well, how do we treat same-sex parents the same as opposite-sex parents? We have to deny the reality of biology and say, well, whoever says, you know, we're committed to each other in marriage, uh, the state essentially is deciding what qualifies as, mar as, as parenthood. By saying, well, as long as you see, for a long time, um, same sex, uh, same sex couple, the uh, non biological parent did not go on the birth certificate. Well, at least there was at least some clarity there in sanity back then. But until more until 2017. Obergefell. Uh, no, uh, well, Pavan. It was Pavan, which was based on Obergefell. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um, which said, well, if they're legally married... Drawing from the premises in Obergefell, yeah. Yes, by saying if they're legally married, if a same-sex couple is legally married, then the, the legal spouse, who has no biological connection to the child... Yep. So again, biology is dismissed. Matter. Did you know every one of these issues it ha rests on biology, on yeah. recognizing biology? So in e and like you said, in each case, from, uh, from having a pre-political right, to having a right that the state defines. It's a huge power grab by yeah, the state. Uh, yeah, because now they get to define fundamental human institutions. So as you right, put right. in your book, um, significantly in each case, the state has chosen the postmodern approach of dismissing natural realities and substituting legal fiat. Yeah. It refuses to be held in check by respect for the created world. The concept of contract is sold to the public as a way of expanding choice, but in reality, it cuts us off from natural created relationships and hands over power to the state. So you called it a freedom that dissolves freedom. It dissolves the real freedom. It's profound. Yeah. <laughs> no other Christian thinker has, has, has applied this level of kind of theological clarity to the culture wars. Thank you, Nancy. Incredible. So what are you working on now? 
But first, we want to give a thank you to our sponsor, Every Life Diaper Company. Every Life Diaper. Go to everylife.com. Use promo code SETH10. Listen, do you have grandkids? Do you have nieces or nephews? Do you buy diapers for your aunts or uncles or for your grandkids or for your kids' kids or for your kids? Are you still having babies? You got lots of poop around the house? What about your nursery at your church? Maybe you're a pregnancy resource center. Maybe you just want to gift someone for a baby shower. Every major diaper company in America rhetorically or financially supports the abortion industry. Wild, unreal, can't make it up. The baby industry helping subsidize the killing of babies so they sell less diapers. Every Life Diaper, the only pro-life diaper company in America. And why do we have them as a sponsor of this show? Because you can't defeat a culture of death by funding that culture of death. You need to fight with your wallets and your dollars and be a steward of the money God has given you. Go to everylife.com, everylife.com, promo code SETH10, SETH10, SETH10 for 10% off your first order. Everylife.com, thank you for being a sponsor of the Seth Gruber Show. <laughs> well, I'm still working on this in the sense of, uh, still still um, out there in public with the, the, the podcast, the, the Twitter fights. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, the, Your tweets have been on fire recently. I've been I've been following them. <laughs> uh, this has been the most controversial book I've written, and that did surprise me. Why is that? Um, it turns out well, it turns out apparently questions of homosexuality and transgenderism still had a fairly wide base of Christians who agreed on it. Sure. But um, this book, um, it's I did not. And let me put it this way: I did not allow. I did not get involved in the complementarian versus egalitarian debate. Because I'm an apologist. I want to help Christians tackle the secular culture. Yeah, yeah. That's my goal. Right, right, right. But too many Christians said, no, 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 no. You, you, have, to, you have to talk to this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I even explain why I don't. Uh, two of my top researchers said egalitarian versus complementarian does not seem to make much of a difference. So the first one was Brad Wilcox. He's a sociologist. When it comes to what? It doesn't make much of a difference when it comes to what? When it comes to how happy the marriage is. Interesting. So Brad Wilcox says, you know, you I, quote he, he did all these. Uh, yeah, he's one of my best researchers. Uh, he, he's considered one of the top, top marriage researchers in the country. And he said, you know, in our studies, we just didn't find much difference. It, the husband's gender theory, how he puts it. <laughs> It does not seem to make much difference in whether his wife is happy or not. Interesting. And then John Gottman, who's considered like perhaps the top marriage psychologist in the country, okay. said, I get people into my practice who sometimes think the man should be in charge and some that are more egalitarian. Right. And he said, I don't see a difference in whether the marriage is happy. And here's how he ends. Emotionally intelligent husbands... <laughs> have figured out the most important thing, which is how to show respect and honor to your wife. Wow. And so both of my top researchers say it doesn't seem to make much difference. In fact, Wilcox even did a study of egalitarian marriages, and he said they weren't any happier. Interesting. <laughs> you, know, you might expect them to be. Interesting. But they weren't. And so I say that, in the, you know, right in the book, I'm not going to deal with this topic because, look, it doesn't make much difference. But everybody wants to drag it into this little in-house debate. Yeah. Whether they're on the egalitarian side or the sort of neo patriarchal side, yeah, 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 yeah. they want they, they want me to be on their side. They want me to take a side, and 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 that's just not my debate. My debate is with the secular world. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Where did the secular? Well, how did the secular world get their idea of masculinity so wrong that so, they? Nancy, think, am I fundamentally toxic? Toxic because of my chromosomes? <laughs> well. You are a Christian man. So, no, actually, what was interesting about the research, this is the most data-driven book I've written. Yeah, I, it, I've noticed. It's, it's very fact-driven. Yeah. And so I did one of the things that I stumbled across you know, I, was that Christian men uh, test out in sociological and psychological studies as being the best husbands and fathers. I was as, I was as surprised as anyone by this. Yeah, uh, the data because, you talk about specifically. Let me so so just to repeat, so people understand what you just said. Committed Christians, right? Not nominal Christians, but like committed involves Christians who are actually under spiritual authority. They attend a local church. They're involved in their church. They take it seriously. Like you know, not nominal Christians, but well, that one, talk about that. Yeah, so that, that's an important distinction because on the one hand, uh, you know, let me get, let me give you the good news first, <laughs> because. Because, you know, the media narrative is that evangelical men are exhibit A of toxic masculinity. I'll give you just one example. Yeah, please. Um, 
because I found lots of them. <laughs> but this was the co-founder of the Church Two movement, which yeah, followed the Me Too movement. Too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And she said, the theology of male headship feeds the rape culture that we see permeating American Christianity today. Hmm. So the social scientists were listening to this and saying, well, where's your evidence? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you're making these charges, but where's your data? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So they went out and did the studies. And I quote some dozen or so studies, yeah, yeah, yeah. all finding that, in fact, Christian men, like you said, who are authentic and committed and attend church regularly, test out as the most loving husbands and fathers. Their wives test out the happiest. Least abusive. Uh, and they do, they do interview the wives separately, which is important. Yeah, yeah. They spend more time with their children, 3.5 hours more per week than secular men. Wow, really? They divorce at a lower rate, 35% lower divorce rate wow. than secular men. And that's interesting. That, I, I read that claim in your book, Nancy, and that was interesting because, you know, you hear these stats all the time in Christendom, in the church, right? What do they say? What do they say? The divorce rate in the, in the church mirrors the divorce rate in the world. In the secular world, in the non-Christian. And, and so to speak to that, you're saying that right. that's actually the way that that's phrased is not accurate. Well, that's the pushback I always get. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. I, yeah. In fact, I just got about five times yesterday on Twitter. Okay. <laughs> it yeah, came yeah. up and, you know. Um, and so the researchers did, they went back and made that very crucial distinction between men who are committed and yeah. church going versus nominals. By the way, my students don't even know what nominal means, so I have to explain. <laughs> N-O-M is Latin for name, so it means in name yeah. only. Yeah. So these are men who might check the Baptist box, for sure. example, on a survey, but who don't attend church. You know, it's a cultural background, a family background. And they test out shockingly different. They fit all the toxic stereotypes. Wow. You know, their, their wives report the lowest level of happiness. They spend the least amount of time with their kids. They divorce at an even higher rate than secular men, 20% higher Mm. It's secular men. And well, you're saying that that men in Christian name only yeah. have a higher divorce rate than the pagan, non-religious, non-Christian secular world. And they have the highest rate of secular, <laughs> highest rate of domestic abuse yeah. and violence, oh my God. higher than secular men. Wow. So this is what we're up against, like in the church. Yeah. How do we encourage the men who are doing a good job? Yeah. You know, we want to do, but how do we reach out then to these men who are using the language of headship and submission, but yeah. infusing yeah. those words yeah. with secular meanings. Yeah. You know, they're taking meanings from the secular world. Yeah. And and then they end up actually being worse than secular men. Yeah. You know, wow. How can the church reach out and disciple yeah. these men yep. and, and help bring them into a, a, a more biblical view of masculinity? Yeah. Yeah. That's so good, Nancy. The reason I'm appreciating your book right now and why I want everyone to read it is because you can imagine as the CEO of a pro-life organization that's now the fastest pro-life organization in the country with a team largely, I have some women on my team, but largely of men. Uh, I mean, like, literally, my organization, Nancy, is like the like archetype of the toxic masculinity label that we get from the secular culture, right? I'm oppressing women's bodies by asking them not to kill their babies, right? I'm a Christian toxic nationalist because I want, uh, I don't know, the preborn child to have the right to life, uh, recognized in our constitution at the federal level in all 50 states. And so, like, when I, I'm actually the one who's saying, like, we're in this position in the culture, one, with the killing of babies and abortion, of course, but also just in the broader culture of death in America, because men have abdicated their duty to be defenders and protectors, because they haven't been leading the way to protect children, women, yeah, let me give you, children. Let me give you a, a really interesting study on this. So this was the first cross-cultural study ever done on concepts of masculinity. Yeah, talk about that. David Gilmore, um, anthropologist, and... He found that despite differences between cultures, there is a common code of manhood that's global, that's yes. universal. Yes, this was fascinating. Keep going. And and he uh, summarizes it as the you know the good man does the th does three things. He calls them the three P's: okay. provide, protect, and procreate. Yeah, have a family. Yeah, build into the next generation. Yeah, and the amazing thing about this about this is not just countries with uh, some sort of Christian background. It's universal. Or as we would say, they're made in God's image. It's software. So, yeah, it's, it's the male software. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's innate. It's inherent. Yeah. It's intrinsic. So men do know what the good man is. Mm. and mm. That's good. Uh, and our job then is, can, can we help them reconnect yeah. with that innate knowledge that your goal is not to use your uh, unique masculine strengths, because yeah. men are bigger, stronger, faster than women. Yeah. You, you, unique masculine strengths are not given you to get whatever you want. That's right. 
But in your heart of hearts, you know That's right. it's given you to provide, protect, care for those people that you love. Cross cultural lines and religious lines, men just knew when they were asked. They did. It's fascinating. They did. And, and, and then to add a little nuance, there was another study that showed that men actually are sort of trapped between two scripts. And this was by a sociologist, Michael Kimmel. And yeah, neither of these. Neither, guy, neither of these guys are Christian. Right. Um, but he gets invited to speak all around the world. So he also did a global study mm. where he asked young men in particular uh, two questions. First, what does it mean to be a good man? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You're at a funeral and in the eulogy, somebody says, you know, he was a good man. What does that mean? And the sociologist said, all around the world, men had no trouble answering that. They immediately started listing duty, honor, integrity, wow. sacrifice, do the right thing. Yeah. Uh, look out for the little guy. Yeah, yeah. I like that one. Uh, be a protector, be a provider, yeah. be responsible. And he would ask them, well, where'd you learn that? They'd say, I don't know. It's just in the air we breathe. Or if they were in a Christian country, they would say it's part of our Judeo-Christian heritage. Yeah, so that was that was the answer to the question, what does it mean to be a good man? A good man. Okay. And so it, it overlaps with the previous study because, again, it shows that innately, universally, they knew they do know what it means to be a good man. Wow. But then he asked a follow-up question, and he said, what does it mean if I say, man up, be a real man? Man up, yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And he actually said, man the F up. <laughs> yeah, okay. Just gave it a little... Yeah, 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 yeah. And the young men themselves would say, oh, no, no, that's very different. You know, that's... The... Okay. That's very yeah. different. That means be tough, never show weakness, uh, win yeah. at all costs. Get laid. That was my last one. <laughs> I saved that Sorry, one. I'm reading your book right now. <laughs> I'm, I'm stealing your thunder, I apologize. You know, never show weakness. Yeah. Yeah, uh, be competitive, get rich, get laid, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> using their language. And so wow. sociologists concluded that men are, in a sense, trapped between these two scripts. They do intrinsically, inherently know what the good man is. Yeah. Um, but wow. they also feel this cultural pressure of the, the quote-unquote real man, which are very different traits. Macho. Yeah, and, and they're not all bad. Like, we, we want yeah. people to hang tough in yeah, the crisis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But if they get disconnected from the moral ideal, That's then right. they can slide into being That's right. toxic and you know, yeah. entitlement, dominance, control, misogyny, and so on. That's right. And so, again, once again, the, the, the good part about this is it tells us a better approach to these issues. Yeah. It's much better to try to f encourage and support and you know, draw out the in in innate knowledge of what it means to be the good man. Yeah, and yeah. Most men don't respond very well to being called toxic. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Most people wouldn't. Yeah, yeah. So instead, if we can approach it with the positive message yeah. and try to connect with that side of their innate knowledge of the good man, it gives us a much more positive way to approach yeah. these issues. Wow. Nancy, I could talk to you for hours. We have to have you back on. Yeah, yeah. Guys, she even makes a point in her book with data and research that it's actually like in, in, in other areas of the country where they've had a very pagan society or culture um, that when their quote unquote men get saved and become Christians, they start being the best husbands, the best fathers that actually they it, it was actually called like a um, something you called it like some woman called it like a functional women's right um, movement yeah. or something like that, because now the rights of women were being protected because of Christianity and reforming to the faith. But they're calling Christianity and white Christian men in particular toxic. Yeah, <laughs> it's, you, it's, it's, you know, it's most, I, I, to limit the book, it's mostly America, but I did have a yeah. section, an international section. Now, I quote three different anthropologists wow. who all say that Christianity in Africa or South America has had, like you said, both of them use, two, two of them actually use the word that Christianity is the best women's movement. The best women's <laughs> movement. Isn't that such because a different it, script than what we're being told? It, it raises the status of women. Yeah, that's so good. When a man becomes a Christian, he stops gambling, drinking, going to prostitutes, wow. brings his money home to his family. Yeah. Family experiences a, an increase Shit. in the standard of living, and the whole family benefits. Wow. And, and these were not necessarily Christian researchers saying these things. That's right, yeah. They, but they recognize the impact that Christianity has all around the world when it goes to a new culture. Wow. It raises the status of women and Crazy. children. Amazing. <laughs> Nancy, uh, we're going to have to bring you to one of our screening events when we go on our national screening tour for my movie, The 1916 Project, to dive more into these ideas and uh, get you on more stages. The clarity, the thinking. Um, guys, you got to pick up this book, The Toxic War of Masculinity, How Christianity Reconciles the Sexes. Uh, one of the most important books out there right now. 
Uh, Nancy, will you come back on sometime? Oh, absolutely. It's fun talking with you. Awesome. Thank you so much. Keep up the good work.